Philip, there are two ways I could look at the world. One, a physicalist point of view, that everything can be reduced down to fundamental physics. A lot of scientists think that. The other is sort of a dualistic approach, that um, I have a spirit in my brain that enables my mind to exist, and maybe there's a God in some dualistic way. You've postulated that emergence is somehow a third way. How does your emergence work? Yeah, that's a beautiful way to frame the question, Robert, because that's the cultural dilemma that we face today. The amazing success of physics makes us think that we will ultimately be able to tell the story all the way down and then to build it up floor by floor until we have this giant edifice of a successful completed science. On the other hand is the traditional often religious view or religiously motivated view that we possess a spirit or a soul and that that is always beyond the reach of science. And so we find ourselves as human beings torn in this tension between these two radically different And they approaches. seem irreconcilable. Yeah, and they are irreconcilable <laughs> in those terms, aren't they? If it turns out that science, broadly conceived, is supporting a different view, is undercutting that old dichotomy and helping us to build up a story of the emerging world and of ourselves, step by emerging step, that would be a fascinating new understanding of who we are in the world. Okay, so what do we do with these two irreconcilable positions? How does emergence help us to maybe understand something new? Yeah. I think what I want to argue is that the, those two positions are philosophically motivated. There was a certain motivation going back to Newton and the dawn of modern physics to tell the story building block by building block. There was a religiously motivated answer which said we have to have an eternal soul in us. If we drop both of those, then it seems to me the space is open for some really interesting empirical So you're saying work. both of those ideas are really philosophical because theologians would say that that's really spiritual and the physic uh, people who, who uh, believe in, in the reductionism would say that it's, it's purely empiric empiricism, that this is the way the world is and you, to, to inject philosophy in this, you're, you're injecting something that is artificial and doesn't make any sense. I guess at the risk of overstating it, I'd say that they're really ideologies. There's an ideology of the unity of science, and it's having the ability to be the final explanatory right. framework for all questions. Right. And then there's an ideology that unless you introduce God and a sort of theological perspective, you can't understand the human person. Yeah. Or and if we drop those, what happens in that space? Okay, state? all right, I'm gonna drop it for a moment. <laughs> now, where am I? I've, now I'm left with nothing. All right, well, let's build up from nothing then. <laughs> what do we see? In physics, we see the development as more complex systems are formed of particles, new dynamics emerge. Thermodynamics is a, is a sort of dynamic that we can trace and understand, has its own laws and principles, that emerges out of collections of particles. What does that mean by emergence? Is it, is it, you mean it's, it's absolutely not predictable in terms of our current science, but is it, is it not predictable in principle? Emergence doesn't mean non-predictability. So if I know, for example, that thermodynamic systems exist, I actually can develop laws to explain the emergence of, the becoming into existence of this new sort of dynamic. Emergence means a sort of dynamic that exists in systems of a certain level of complexity that does not exist in systems of less complexity. But they are predictable from the characteristics of, of the lower levels? In some cases, they're predictable. <laughs> Usually in physics, once we look at some system that has come to emerge, let's say physical chemistry, once we have the periodic table, we can explain right. how we derive such a thing. Right. There's something called the Pauli exclusion principle, and that's the law by which the orbitals of atoms are, are filled. And we now with electrons. Can, uh, right, with electrons. And we can tell, following the Pauli exclusion principle, how the next level will go, and we can construct those vertical columns in the periodic table. But can you predict from the level of electrons what will be the shared qualities down the vertical columns of the um, periodic table? That turns out not to be true. You have to actually examine the world at the level of chemistry to see what the inert gases share, the noble gases, and so forth. So at each level, you're saying there are some characteristics at each level as you build up physical systems from fundamental physics that has its own laws, so to speak, its own way of doing things? Right. The world happens, not for philosophical reasons, that's ideology, but as a matter of observation. The world happens to divide into these multiple levels of organization. 
And emergence is merely the insistence that we study each level of organization on its right. own level. G give me some of these hierarchies. How, how would you go from bottom to top, real quick? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, some people have argued already that at the level of uh, quantum physics, giving rise to the world of macrophysics that we see around us. Mm -hmm. That already represents a level of emergence. Actually, that's a fascinating one because the qualities of macrophysics are so radically different, different sure. than the qualities sure. of the micro world. Okay, so you right. go from physics to chemistry, chemistry right. to biology. Right, and so we have these more and more complicated chemical systems, right, and then at some point in the evolution of the world, we have self-reproducing cells. The qualities of those cells on which natural selection can operate are different than the qualities of the things that compose them. And the study of, of the origin of life today is trying to understand how cosmic evolution made this leap, made this step. Now, once we have it, we may have laws to, to reconstruct how it happened. And, but, and then going from biology to consciousness, I assume you would have some kind of an emergence at that point, too. Right, but without biology, we'll turn out to have a number of steps where more complicated systems construe a level of explanation here that can't be given fully at that lower level. You've talked about the difference between strong emergence and weak emergence. Tell me what that's about. Okay, what we are trying to understand, if, let's imagine that you give me that much. It looks like the world has these mm -hmm. emergent levels. Mm -hmm. And then we want to understand what are the relationships between any two levels. Right. Weak emergence would say that the broader system, the whole, in some given case, constrains the behaviors of the parts. And so that we can't fully explain the behaviors of the parts without, those, without considering those constraining factors. Think of a, a wheel rolling down a hill. Right? The fact that the particles of the wheel are contained in this circular structure means that they do a different dynamic as they roll down the yeah. hill. There's nothing mystical about Not that. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. It, but it does represent a different way of doing science because now we'll have perhaps equal attention to the constraining factors at the level of the whole as we do to what the parts are doing. And can I just point out that science has not always proceeded in that way. Again, for Newton, the idea was to build up step sure, by sure. step from the properties of the parts. Sure. Many people still feel that way. Yeah. And, but the weak emergentists would say, no, 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 There's, that's a mistake. We need to study the properties of these holes and understand scientifically how they constrain the properties of the parts. Okay, strong emergence? And then strong emergence says that in at least some cases, that's not sufficient. The two kinds of cases that are most often cited are the case of organisms functioning in an ecosystem and the case of thought. In an organism, to say that the organism somehow constrains the behavior of the parts, only the parts are active and the organism is only a constraint, seems counterintuitive. Mm. For a biologist, for a zoologist, for an, um, mm. a primatologist, we're interested in looking at what the organism actually does. Right? It, it uh, looks for a food source. The wolf engages in play behaviors with another wolf. That's an activity. If the organism is doing things, why not say that the organism, in its choice, in its behavior, is causing its parts to do what they do? Mm. That strong emergence. Now, how is that, that's top-down as opposed to bottoms-up? How, how, how do you characterize that? Right. The, often in the, the debate, we use these two terms. A bottom-up type of explanation would be to build from the parts step-by-step step until we construct the whole. Right? A top-down explanation would be to ask, what is this organism trying to achieve in its environment? Let's say that we have a stalking behavior of a lion. And we can only understand the behavior of all those little cells if we say, what is the lion trying to achieve in this evolutionary system? Well, if, if I explain what happens in the cells by the intention of the lion, then I've given you a top-down explanation. Now, if you say top-down, that can either be strong or weak? Generally, it's strong. Uh, we define a strong emergence as one that grants real top-down influence. Now, is that an influence that is something that we're reading into the situation and it's our way of, uh, of understanding it? Or is you're saying there's something fundamental in the system that's really there that's causing a, a top-down causation, in yeah. a sense? Yeah, let me put, it, put the point strongly. I would call that the physicist's ideology. To say that in a biological system, when you explain the behavior of, of animals, 
by the intentions of the animals, what they're doing in their ecosystem, that that is reading into the context. Right. To the biologist, it's just natural to say, well, look, the animal's trying to achieve this goal in order to survive, to reproduce successfully. That's what it does as a biological organism, right? So to speak of that as just reading our own desires into yeah. it um, seems to me an ideology. It's sim the world simply doesn't work that how animals behave in their system is merely a matter of compounding the effects of all their individual cells, which in turn is compounding the effects of all the individual chemicals. What, what you're forced to think about, it, if it's not that, then what is it? What is happening? If it's not the combination of all the cells and all the things causing this thing at the top, if it's not that, what is it? What is there? Yeah. I think how we should think about it is that the world is upwardly open. Just as a matter of contingent fact of this universe, when you get more complex systems, they're constrained by the lower levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing the lion does can break the laws of physics. That I hold to seriously. <laughs> right? But the laws of physics don't determine or dictate the behavior of the lion. There is what we call behavioral plasticity, an openness in an ecosystem to multiple behaviors, variations that you find in more complex systems. And those of us who defend strong emergence are saying, that turns out to be an essential feature of the world as it's evolved. This upward openness, which means that if you want to explain behaviors at some level, you have to look at the organisms, the entities at that particular level. Of course, as scientists, we're interested in tightening the connections downward as tight as we can make them. This is not a kind of gleeful holism. Oh, leave science behind and let's just intuit our way, our mi our way into the mind of the lion. So emergence is different than holism. Yeah, oh, gleeful holism. <laughs> but, but you must encounter it, uh, and one hears it occasionally when you will see um, somebody who says, I don't care about the physics, I don't care about the chemistry, I don't care about the neurology. To me, it's just obvious that at some given level this is happening. And that would not at all be the position that I advocate. Mm -hmm. We tighten the connections downward absolutely as strictly as we can make them. But we recognize that the lower levels are a kind of leash. Sometimes the leash is very, very short and it virtually dictates the next higher level. Let's say um, physics, macrophysics to, to physical chemistry. That's a very tight leash. But in other places, the leash is very loose. I mean, it's, it's turning out today that the way that genes are expressed depends a lot on the functioning of the cell, the intracellular environment, the relations of cells within a particular organ, the developmental history of the organism, and the organism's relationship with its broader environment. Each of those is a leash with some non-zero link, right? And if we now, if we add them all together, as it were, we recognize there's a lot of play on this leash by the time you get to the dog engaging in play behaviors with another dog.